Hello and good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you today, but I'm quite a distance from Edinburgh. But I, you know, I've, I've, I'm recording this paper. We cannot see the past, perceptions of the past and archaeology in Hodson's The Nightland. Into the Nightland. When we think of late 19th, early 20th century science fiction, we think of names such as Verne and Wells, authors many times reprinted and still read over a century later. However, there were also writers who were not well remembered who were never reprinted. Hodson is not that man. His works mainly short tales of the sea but also detective stories and poems have been reprinted many times yet he is still relatively unknown the nightlands along with the house on the borderlands are his two novels of cosmic horror many readers rate the night house on the borderlands as his best but this scholar favors the nightlands in it, the sun is long dead in this tale of an extreme future, millions of years hence, and earth is slowly dying. For the last million years or so, mankind is confined to a great pyramidal autarky, the eight miles tall great redoubt. Though no dystopia, the inhabitants feel both doomed and trapped and yearn for more. Only the most adventurous and the most foolish explore before the pyramids confines to the peril of both body and soul. William Hope Hodson's The Nightland from 1912 is one of the great early science fiction epics. It is the tale of a young man and his quest to find his beloved in the sunless world inimical to man. The rambling and difficult of language, this obscure book has been read and reread over the 110 years since it was written, has been an inspiration to other works from Tolkien to Lovecraft to Lewis to Lee Groon, all have drawn inspiration from this obscure work of fiction. He has been translated into several other languages, among them Russian and Japanese. Difficult of language, the nightland has been difficult of language, the nightland has been recreated recently. Like many early scientific romances such as uh, Edison's The Worm Arrow Borrows from nineteen twenty two, the nightland is written in fake Jacobean language. Well, it is moot if they spoke like that even back then. It is rich, extravagant, and turgid with words and an excess of capital letters. I, I hope I'm getting all these capital letters in because there's a lot of them. Some have likened it to the Old Testament. Certainly this barrier has deterred many who might otherwise have enjoyed it. Recently, in 2011, the tale was rewritten in more digestible form by James Stoddard. Stoddard names their prot protagonist, whereas Hudson leaves them anonymous. And he also adds things like dialogue, of which there is none in the original. 
He improves upon characterization and pacing to make a much more comprehensible tale, but one that hopefully retains its cosmic horror and dark vision. He uses the tool of a diary kept by the hero as a method to break Hodson's sometimes dreary monotony. Stardard is to be praised for this doubly difficult task, not only recreating, but keeping the original interest and feel of the tale. It is a short story surely made for film, doubly so with modern CGI techniques. Would you like to see the hero's frantic race carrying his beloved to the safety of the Great Redoubt on the big screen? I know I would. I'm not even a cinema goer. Ne- never been in cinema in my life. Never mind. The terrifying fights with monsters. The ferocious night hounds, which are described as big as horses. The terrifying silent ones, and the utterly unspeakable House of Silence. However, it might be a bit dark. The Great Redoubt The Great Redoubt is humanity's last and greatest creation. It is eight miles high and five and a quarter miles along each side. It has 1,380 floors, each a separate city-state, with its own culture and identity. Indeed, each has its own race of man. Powered by the earth current, the Great Redoubt is protected by the limes of the earth clog, an esoteric electrical barrier that protects from the evils without. Beneath the Great Redoubt is the Underground Fields, a subterranean farm 306 layers deep. The bottommost is the 100 mile square country of silence, where the dead of the Great Redoubt have returned to the sacred earth current. This zone is so extensive that it is its own lakes and rivers where the hero describes sailing a small boat. The Great Redoubt is made from an unnamed grey metal, maybe aluminium. Aluminium would have been pretty science fiction back in 1912. The same as the hero's armour and weapons. It is home to marvellous technologies powered by the earth current, such as lifts and moving walkways. Outside is the Nightlands, a dark valley inhabited by monsters, abhumans, and forces of evil. Chief of these are the Four Watchers, mountain-like creatures who over the millennia have slowly, slowly got closer and closer to the Great Redoubt. Huge and impeccable as they are, they cannot approach beyond the air clog. This seemingly delicate barrier only a glowing line six inches across can repel even them. How do the people of this society perceive both the millennia long past of their home and their previous life in the sun? Many of the great redoubts, countless millions of inhabitants are scholars or have scholarly interests alongside their physical and martial arts pursuits. Each level has its libraries and museums, and in the topmost level, the Tower of Observation of the Monstracuans is the Great Library and Great Museum. Did I get those uh, capital letters in? Can you hear the capital letters? Never mind. This place holds technological marvels such as flying machines and massive energy cannon, technologies not used in millennia. The protagonist describes these artifacts and then goes on to explain why they are of no use on his quest. He has a thoughtful understanding of their limitations. The sun is dead this past million years and the phenomenon argued by some to be mere myth. There is no agreement between the many great redoubt scholars. This researcher believes that this harmless conflict keeps the last of humanity from dying of boredom. There are also tales of the great roads visible from the great redoubt, built by men in the age of twilight, 
and travelled by moving cities following the slowing sun. Also accounts of the Lesser Redoubt, a minor autarchy created by one of the great builders' redoubts who disagreed with his fellows and moved out. The main scientific element of the Great Redoubt are the Monstracuans. Who are they and what do they do? Monstracuans observe and record monsters such as this giant slug. I was at least half a mile from it when I photographed it, I assured you, and I wasn't going to get any closer. It was a really big slug. The lettuce leaf was even bigger. The Great Redoubt is surrounded by forces of evil, attracted to by the many human souls, as sharks are to a steamer with bullocks on board. Hudson is famed for his nautical horror stories. It is the Monstracuans' job to record and study what they can observe with their spy glasses. The very largest are the size of mountains and are dubbed the Watchers, as seen on the last slide. They also develop technologies which are of use in their limited situation. For example, they have found that using distance weaponry on the forces of darkness not only diminishes the vital earth current and endangering everybody, but provokes them to further attack. Mostly the abhumans are left in peace, unless they threaten the Great Redoubt closely, and the inhabitants of the Great Redoubt are all trained in the martial arts and close combat weapons. The air clog is another line of defence developed after the building of a great without. The pyramid has a futuristic rapid media system known as the hour slips. Thus the public as a whole take a great interest in the nightlands and the progress of any heroes. Most of the tension of the story comes at a time when the hero knows he is being watched and the high emotions his vicissitudes generates, which may attract emotion-seeking esoteric hunters. Some sciences have by necessity been allowed to lapse, such as the creation and use of flying machines. An interesting scene in the story is when the hero finds and inspects a crashed flyer. Why are such perilous expeditions conducted into the nightland? Do they have genuine scholarly intent or are they merely a rite of passage? The people of the Great Redoubt take a great interest in the nightlands, in spite of the safe and stimulating environment of their autarky. Most individuals possess a spyglass to view from the 1,200,000 embrasures of a great redoubt. Oh boy, I don't want to see that window cleaning bill, do you? The protagonist describes a popular childhood game in which young folk compete to have spied the most fearsome and ugly monster they may observe. To go outside is to perform heroics, even though it might end in death. And worse than death, for some perils, the nightland in danger of a very soul. To this end, not only do the aspirants don special armour and carry scripts of food tablets and dehydrated water, they undergo a three-day spiritual preparation and are made holy. And here I must mention that it was Hudson here who invented the concept of dehydrated water which kind of sounds difficult. I, I think I would rather than carry something like a miniature version of the Star Wars vaporator and get water out of the air. You know, dehydrated water, that's a, that, that's a, well, you now know where this particular trope originated. They are also fitted with a poison capsule under the skin of their wrists. If the worst comes to the worst, they can save their souls at the expense of their lives. They are armed with a powerful discos, a marvellous science fiction weapon quite as miraculous as a lightsaber. Here's me, the 
big Star Wars fan speaking. Indeed, like a lightsaber, they are said to have a spiritual connection with their owners. In Hodson's words, And here I must make known that these weapons did not shoot, but had a disc of a grey metal, sharp and wonderful, that spun in the end of a rod of grey metal, and were in some way charged by the earth current, so that were any but were stricken thereby, we were cut in twain as easy as ought. And the weapons were contrived to be to the repelling of any army of monsters that might make to win entrance to the redoubt. And to the eye they had somewhat the look of strange battle axes, and might be lengthened left by pulling out of the handles. I mean, great thing indeed. Love to see that on the screen. Who are the abhumans? What does their material culture consist of, if any? Hodgson describes some abhuman societies as having high technology, like the Great Redoubt. However, unfortunately, these are not examined closely, and the abhumans the protagonist encounters are all very much primitives. So do they have a material culture? Not really. Though of course that might be because of the extreme difficulty in observing them without getting attacked. And the fact that the Monstracuans concentrate their studies on far more worrying entities, like the Watchers. They use rocks as tools and weapons and rely on their great strength to get things done. This recalls the French doctor Marie-Jean Kaufman's description of a Caucasian wild man, hairy humans who may or may not have had a material culture at some time, but now, in her words, knew less about her tools than the least chimpanzee. She believed that given equipment and encouragement, a wild man could rediscover the use of tools. Hodson knew nothing about wild men, of course, but he described the humped men who have such well-developed shoulder muscles they are stooped, and indeed some abhumans are very hairy. He was the science fiction writer who invented the term abhumans. These creatures are the devolved remnants of people who did not enter the great without. Sun. 1st of November 1877 to the 17th of April 1918. This isn't the clearest of pictures, but to this scholar's mind, possibly the most candid and informal. William Hope Hodson was a spirited boy who grew into a fearless man, bullied for his small build in the Merchant Navy, he was uh, five foot six inches tall, which is, to my mind, not that small. Being five foot eight myself, but uh, I'm quite a big person. Most of my family are far smaller. But he was one of the first to promote bodybuilding, even taking place in the famed showdown with Harry Houdini himself. He is mostly remembered for his weird tales of the sea. Is the protagonist of the Nightlands Hodson himself? An interesting question, and when I will leave for you. Some heroes are defiantly an ideal version of the author. Kim of Richard Kipling's novel of that name is most definitely Kipling himself, to give one fairly famous example. Hodson's hero is like him, interested in bodybuilding, in order to stand a chance against bullies. And it could be no more bullier than a 12-foot abhuman. He is brave and passionate, However, Hodson, unlike his hero, was never deeply in love. He married oddly late in life, and from what we know of him, he was never a romantic. He died in 1918 in the trenches of the Great War. 
In one of his last letters, he writes, The sun was pretty low as I came back, and far off across that desolation, here and there they showed just formless, squarish, cornerless masses erected by man against the infernal storm that sweeps forever, night and day, day and night, across that most atrocious plain of destruction. My God, talk about a lost world. Talk about the end of a world. Talk about the nightland. It is all here, not more than 200 odd miles from where you sit infinitely remote. And the infinite, monstrous, dreadful pathos of the things one sees. The great shell hole with over 30 crosses sticking up in it, some just up out of the water, and the dead below them, submerged. Not everybody can survive the night lands. Thank you, and good night. I hope to have raised awareness and a greater appreciation of this particular novel it's uh it's i think it is in print now but it's also available online you would find it on the william hope Hodson's wikipedia page my edition was the 1979 one by spear and i've also put in james stoddard's version and the the nightland website where there's a a lot of stories and pictures and discussions of of this particular fiction and indeed the rest of Hodson's work. See you next Tag Conference.